Okay, everybody, we're going to get going. Again, feel free to keep eating. I won't be offended. So just keep eating. Do your thing. We want to keep you uh, keep this on time and get you out of here as close to 3.30 as possible. Welcome back to those of you in virtual land. I wanted to um, do a quick couple of jump into this next topic. Some of you saw the, the beautiful quote on page 21. Kind of a piece of it. Um, but it's from Forming Intentional Disciples. I think it'd be a good way for us to kind of, page 21. And again, he kind of did the bookends of this, of this quote when he was speaking, but it's one of my favorite quotes from, from Sherry Wadon's book. The significant number of disciples changes everything. A parish's spiritual tone energy level, attendance, and what parishioners ask of their leaders. Disciples pray with passion. Disciples worship. Disciples love the church and serve her with energy and joy. Disciples give lavish, lavishly. Disciples hunger to learn more about their faith. Disciples fill every formation class in a or diocese. Disciples manifest charisms and discern vocations. They clamor to discern God's call because they long to live it. Disciples evangelize because they have really good news to share. Disciples share their faith with their children. Disciples care about the poor and about issues of justice. Disciples take risks for the kingdom of God. So, you know, if you're, you ever get in a situation where you're like, why am I doing this disciple making? Boy, why am I doing this? Pull that quote out. I do it regularly. Just pull that quote out. And then you right. Then you're going to remember the people who have been in your life, hopefully right now that are around you. You're going to remember what, through God's grace, what you're trying to offer to the church. And it doesn't take a lot, as we talked about earlier. It doesn't take a lot. I, I love that expression of the uh, the Right? It doesn't take that many. Um, we're gonna, so this afternoon, as Chris was saying, we're gonna be moving into like an action part of this where we're gonna take theory that we talked about this morning and then start to put it in practice. What are some ways that we can do this as individuals, both in terms of right now, we're gonna talk about giving witness, giving personal testimony. Chris is gonna take that journey of discipleship and walk you through it again, but thinking through practical ways phase, how do I walk with them at that moment? And so we'll have a nice back and forth on that. And then we're going to take all of that and say, what does it all look like in an evangelizing parish? What does all this look like? And that's going to be, a, we're going to have a rambunctious conversation at that time. We're going to go crazy, we're going to go nuts. And we're going to have a good time. You're going to, if you think I've been energetic up to this point, I'm going to lose my mind in the last one, right? As you can imagine, I have no, no opinions, nothing to share here. I'm very... I'm going to share this with Christmas. You said he was texting one of our colleagues and saying, boy, you can tell Michael uh, we haven't done this in a while, and he's excited about being back in person with people again. So, and there's truth to that. So thank you for your, your presence here today. A prayer. As we start our afternoon together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the gift of this beautiful day. We thank you for the gift of this season of Easter where we are reminded of your Son's victory over sin and death. We are reminded of the hope that is ours. The hope that we can be with you through your grace with you for eternity. We thank you for calling us to be disciples. We thank you for calling us to share your good news with all those we put into onto our paths of life. We pray in a particular way, Lord, right now, for any people in our lives that come to mind, in our mind and hearts, who aren't close to you right now, who maybe are struggling in some way. We just think of those names silently right now.
We entrust all of them into your care. We ask you to send disciples into their lives <coughs> to give testimony of love of your son. Mother Mary, we entrust all of our praise to you. We entrust this afternoon to you, to your motherly care as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. In turn. Page 39. So one other thing that disciples do is give testimony to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, again, when we do this presentation, we do this workshop in Boston area, and we start talking about personal testimony, it's another opportunity for people to pass out in the middle of our day. People really tense up at this point. I remember we, one of the first times we gave this particular talk in Boston, even there was a priest who was visibly not, he was a younger guy too, visibly upset about this. And he literally said, but the church doesn't do this. Catholics don't give testimony like this. And I said, um, uh, Father, can you go to Acts of the Apostles? <laughs> there seem to be a couple of moments in there where the apostles are giving personal testimony to faith in Jesus Christ, right? It's as Catholic as can be. It's as Catholic as can be. And I think why people get a little nervous is they don't really know what we're talking about here. Because again, people go to dot places in their mind, like you just pick a moment in the middle of the movie theater or at the mall, wherever it is, and you stop talking about Jesus. And again, if God is calling you to do that, go for it. Good luck, and go for it. That's fine. But that's not really what we're talking about, okay? So this is going to be probably the shortest presentation of the day, and then we're going to have some time to guide you into crafting. Hey, how many experience, by the way? I'm like, you, you kind of have a go-to two- to three-minute personal testimony, I mean, and, 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 and I've used it before. Yeah, okay, good, good. By the end of this, you're all going to at least have crafted one, and hopefully a few more of you will share it with this large group. That's where we're heading. I'm preparing you now. We won't force anybody to do anything. We believe in free will. All right. So what is a personal testimony, right? We have it right here. It's very simple. A personal account of how you have come to know God more deeply and how your life has changed because of that relationship. It is not a treaty, a theological treatise that you're giving. It is not your entire life story. That takes too long, right? It is a very specific accounting of something that's happened in your life or some things that happened in your life that has drawn you deeper into a relationship with Christ and caused your life to change. And for the disciple who has been on this journey, while you should have, theoretically, many stories to share. And you don't have to give them all in one sitting, okay? <laughs> but you should have many. When I look back on my journey, I have lots of these beautiful moments of God stepping into my life, reaching into my life, and drawing me deeper, sometimes back into a relationship with Him, or deeper into a relationship with Him. And so what, what we want to do here is begin to reflect on those stories, write them out, and practice them. It's another similar to the charisma activity. Why? Well, we already said the first one, so you can reflect on your life. <laughs> this is good. And by the way, I hope you do that often. Um, maybe you, you're like me. There, there are things that happen. And you, in your life, like, especially with children, right? There are things that happen with one of your kids and it, it makes you think of something from your childhood and you start to, it kind of goes from there. You begin to think of all these happenings in your life and, and hopefully if you're like me, then you also can see God's hand in it. And I, I, it's important that we do that. It's important we stop, take stock of our life to examine our life. 
especially in the context of God's grace and how he's been work in it. Okay. Second reason is so that we can share these stories. Why? Because it engages people in a memorable way. Huh. Why did Jesus use parables? He didn't have to. He's God. He could have zapped things into people's minds and hearts if he wanted to. But why did he do it? Because humans have always and always will love stories. There's something attractive about hearing somebody tell a story, get animated, get sad, get angry, right? Because they're giving something of themselves to the listener. And that's attractive, right? Do you, I, I hope you're with me on this, right? But good storytellers, I love listening to. I love listening to them. You know, the other thing with this is when you're sharing your own story, they can't argue with you. Nice little evangelizing tip there. It's, they, they, what are they going to say to you? Well, that's not true. God didn't do that. Um, yeah, he did. So it's a nice, it diffuses those who want to be antagonistic. And they, when they say to you, well, why do you believe? I think sometimes they expect that you're going to come at them with this list of do's and don'ts or rules. I love these rules. Well, let me tell you why. And when you share this personal story or two from your life, no argument, and it kind of just settles and it creates an even playing field, hopefully that then can create ongoing dialogue with that person. And then lastly, it rouses, right? Chris talked about spiritual curiosity. Well, nothing rouses curiosity more than somebody giving this personal testimony of faith in Christ. Especially, um, I've had people who, now my friends, I have friends I've known since fifth grade and stuff. I think I still shock them, but I work for the church. They still, they're all Catholic, but some are closer to Christ than others. And I think some of us still, I have my best, best friend who's always respected me and he's not close to Christ, and he still comes to my house, you know, and he doesn't live a godly life at all. Well, I know he continues to be curious about his friend who's played golf with and basketball with, maybe caused trouble with back in the good old days, right? I know there's a curiosity there. Just I don't even have to give him a testimony just by his watching and looking at my life. So people... You'll be able to rouse up. So when you know that people are in that threshold of spiritual curiosity, that's a great moment. And Chris is going to talk more about this to share personal testimony, especially if they ask you. It's not threatening and allows them to hear the story, reflect on it, and let God work on them in that moment. All right. So we know the why. We know what it is. When to share personal testimony. Well, the easy one is in the car. I love that one. You've got them captive. <laughs> Make sure it's a good long drive. All right. They can't, I mean, they can, I guess, try to get out, but that won't go well. So um, I like this one when thinking about, I've talked to parents, and, and this is a good one for moms and dads, and especially because I've met a lot of parents who've come to faith after they've had children, and but they still, they're still in their teenage years, so they're still opportunities there for them, but they, they don't, when, how, why, oh, well, because, and you know, like, mom and dad are losing their mind, they love Jesus all of a sudden, <laughs> but what they need to hear is, why, what's happened, mom or dad, and so, you know, when you're in the car, and it's awkwardly silent, and, and you're on a, you know, nice 30-minute drive, give them the two, three-minute testimony, begin to kind of plant those seeds, so they begin to make sense of why this has all changed, in the home. Does that make sense? Right? So, and again, with friends, you can do this. Obviously, at potties, um, sure. <laughs> Maybe after everybody's had a glass of wine. All right? But if people know, right, this is where the evangelizer, remember, we're praying to God, give me, Lord, let me know who and when you want me to engage this mission. And it can happen anywhere, including at a party. And Maybe I've been in, situ in situations at gatherings where, especially at family gatherings, where cousins, aunts, uncles who aren't all in, but they know, again, they know what I do, and they ask that, they start asking me. Sometimes they get very personal. Why do you have so many kids? No. So, but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to share, give a little testimony. Well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you about my wife and I 
just being open to God's will for our lives and trusting, just being open to this, this fruit that comes from our marriage. Because it's about provision. We just trust in God, right? We have to. And that begins to get people thinking a little bit, right? Anytime you're having a deep conversation, I like that one. When you're really locked in with somebody and you're going you know, to wrestle with difficult things, that should serve as an opportunity to, well, let me tell you more from my perspective, from my life. Um, we have some parishes in the Archdiocese of Boston that have really taken to this. And at every social gathering, which of course they haven't really had any for a year, but prior to that, they would intentionally have not staff people, not council members, somebody who just is, somebody with the people would think, wait a minute, that's, that's Joe. Isn't his father a carpenter? No. So, <laughs> right? You get the point there, right? And Joe gets up and gives this two minute, three minute testimony. And they just kind of let it be there. And they go back to the wine and cheese and stuff. Okay. At parent meetings, I'm going to talk about, I'm getting to my big punchline at the end of the day on parents. At parent meetings, especially for sacramental prep, instead of spending so much time talking about where they're going to park, sit, how they're going to take pictures, what they're going to wear, those are all great things. Spend some time in prayer and then have a parent come out, out of the audience. So in other words, they have a kid who's preparing. And share with their friends, their colleagues, coworkers, a two or three minute testimony. So if it's first recon uh, reconciliation, have them give a testimony about encountering God's mercy in the sacrament of confession. If it's the Eucharist, first Eucharist, have them give a testimony about encountering Jesus in the real presence. See what I'm saying? Right? These are all little moments. And the key is don't let it always be the same Don person. We have that default. Pray about it. Not who you want me to call. Think about the disciples in your community. I had a previous parish I lived at. I did this workshop for, for that parish. And the pastor was like, who do I invite? I said, ideally disciples. Well, nobody's going to come. I was like, oh, come on. Yeah, come on. So I said, here's what I want you to do. Gather your ministry leaders for a night of prayer in the church, in front of Jesus, and just spend... 30 minutes in silent prayer and let all of them, let the Holy Spirit put people's names, the disciples' names into their hearts and minds. He did it. At the end of it, he had 150 people. And like they literally could say, he couldn't believe it, but each name he heard, he was like, oh my words, yes. Oh my words, yes, yes, yes. And they invited all of them. He did a personal invitation to all of them. 80 showed up both nights that we did. The workshop. It's a pretty good return, right? So, but, he had, to, he had to kind of think outside the box. Same thing here, right? You're going to call people forward in parent meetings or any kind of meeting to give testimony. Don't always settle on the same, same folks. And then in faith formation classes, small groups, this is where we get and train our, our catechists, our music ministers, anybody, especially people in leadership in a parish, train them on how to do personal testimony and encourage them to do so with the folks who are in their care. Um, and again, kids love this, right? Especially high school kids. They love somebody being real and authentic and given the why. Why do I believe? How does Jesus impact it and touch my life? All right. And then we have to take all that and kind of put it into what we call green lights, red lights. Anybody love that game? Yeah, right? well, green light, red lights. But anyway, um, someone may be ready to hear your story if there's a bond of trust between you. I'll get to the why. Don't do it with strangers. There's a bond of trust between you because they already know something about you, right? Maybe even just your life is tweaking curiosity, right? So you're going to take that next step. When they are somebody who has told you that they're asking questions about God, about the Catholic faith, about Jesus. Well, let me tell you about Jesus in my life. The person who is searching for answers and asks for help, they're suffering, they're struggling with this situation. Maybe it's something similar to something you've been through in your life. Oh, you know what? Let me tell you uh, this. I, I went through that before. Let me tell you, Christ got me through that moment in my life. And then when the person asks you for prayer, yes, pray with them. Right there, by the way, would be nice. Right there and then. But it's an opportunity to share a story about God, about somebody else praying for them. Or for you, right? Somebody else praying for you and what that did for your life. When you became aware of that, so many opportunities there in prayer, right? 
red lights. There is no bridge of trust present. In other words, please don't do the supermarket thing. Now, I, I say that. I was saying about my wife. She's so much better than me. She knows I say that every single presentation. Uh, but she is. And when she encounters people in supermarkets who say, oh, my words, all those kids, are they all with the same guy? It, it happens. By the way, that happened once at the parish I'm at right now, and I was standing right there. Too sorry. And I went, and, and Lori was like, him. <laughs> yeah, that guy right next to you. Very weird. People are weird sometimes. She doesn't see those opportunities as a chance by not getting defensive. She, she sees that potentially as a bridge of trust. So she, she can see sometimes when she disarms somebody by, like, no, actually, they're all with the same guy. And she smiles. And sometimes the person goes, oh, well, you're such a beautiful, and they change their tone, you're a beautiful family. Sometimes she'll take it if it turns into a little bit of conversation. She then might kind of go with it. But remember, she built, she kind of built that little bridge of, bridge of trust. Does that make sense? She wouldn't just walk up to somebody, hey, you know why I have eight kids? <laughs> out of the blue, trying to pick some flour out, right? So, all right. If the person's not open to listening to you at any given moment, in other words, be aware. Maybe you've had this experience where I have had this experience where it's obvious, like painfully obvious, I'm on the move, or I'm not in a good mood. It makes sense that I give these things away easily. <laughs> and, and then somebody with good intentions begins to tell you their testimony. And I'm like, I can't do this right now. Now, I love hearing people's personal testimony. But can you imagine the person who doesn't, who never has heard a personal testimony, who does not believe in God, and they don't particularly want to listen to you in a given moment? So just be aware of it, because what can happen is you begin kind of shoving the gospel, in a sense, down their throats without being aware of where they might be in that path towards happiness. This is why we go through, Chris is going to do this whole other thing about the thresholds and the phases. Why? So we just become more aware of signs of where people are and then use different strategies of how to evangelize them in that given moment. All right. So testimony does require trust. And the person should be obviously willing to listen to you in that given moment. I know these things sound so obvious, but believe it or not, it's not for some people. So, okay. So, how to share your personal testimony? First, the ABCs. It actually needs to be audible. You're practicing why? You're practicing so you're prepared to actually share it. Now, I have some people, but well, I don't. My story is not good enough. Remember, we're all called to evangelize. We're all called to evangelize, which means all of our stories will be put to use by God for the right people. Remember that. All of our stories are needed. God knows our story, and he knows exactly the people who need to hear it. So never sell yourself short on this one. Please don't do that. Be ready. Practice. Your story is going to help somebody to take another step on that path towards happiness, towards Christ. Always remember that. And it might be in your life that that story that you're going to, God's going to begin to rise up in you on those stories. You may only use them once, but it'll be for the right person or people. Okay. Um, that being said, we love your stories, but it needs to be brief. Two to three minutes. Can anybody tell me why that might be the case? Attention span. Thank you. Especially in the year 2021. Especially after a year of all of us staring at screens. Right? Sorry for those of you who are staring at the screen right now. Thank you. <laughs> you keep doing that. <laughs> so you want to keep it brief. You want to keep it brief. Plus, if you start doing the 20-minute, 30-minute version of your life story, now, is that what that person actually needs who's in the threshold of curiosity? No. Might that have a place at some point? Sure. I think might have a place at some point. So audible, brief, and then C, Christocentric. Ultimately, in the end, the story, we don't want to be about you. It's about Jesus and you. 
Remember, we're trying to help. This, the whole point of getting personal testimony is to draw people into a relationship with Christ through grace. That's the point of it. And I'll, I'll tell you a reason why that's the point here in a second. All right. And then we have the one, two, threes. And these are just three questions that we're going to run you through a whole little, you're going to write out your testimony here, that you want to try to answer when you're sharing your personal testimony. What was my life like before making Christ the center of my life? Now, people sometimes get nervous about this one. Well, I kind of always been walking with him in my life. Praise God. But what, notice the key here is before making Christ the center of my life, every disciple has a dropping of the net moment, if you will. There's a point in our lives we become conscious that I had given, intentionally given my life to you, Lord. Maybe you've had a couple of those moments because we're sinners. Sometimes we go backwards, right? I know we do this, we kind of show this in a linear way, but it, let's be honest, folks, it's like a, it's kind of a circle with squiggly lines and lines up and down. That's the journey of faith. Um, but what we're talking about here is we want to share with people this idea of, you know, I lost, I was raised in a good Catholic home and I lost my way because of selfishness when I was in college and I stopped praying and I lost hope. You know, God, when I started working at summer camp and God just sent a couple people in my life who just loved me as I am and as I was. Not like loving me because I'm a great sinner. No. They started showing me the dignity of who I am as a child of God. And I found my way back there. True story. Happened in my life. What was that? 25 seconds? You see what I'm saying there? It's thinking of those moments in my life where something clicked, something changed. And again, I was raised in the faith. I wasn't that far away. But there were moments where I... Got lazy. Was my instinct. Was selfish. And God put me back in. What were the experiences that led me to Christ? Now, for some people, how many of you have done like a Crucio or, well, some of you said Life in the Spirit seminar or any kind of retreat that was a major moment in your life? Anybody? Anybody here? Yeah, okay. A lot of people have that experience. Thank God. Um, a lot of people can move through, by the way, the thresholds of conversion in one weekend. Right? Right? So that's kind of cool. So a lot of times we see hear people who give personal testimony and they talk about, and then I went to this retreat. And the retreat did this for me. And the retreat did that for me. And the retreat did this for me. And the retreat, the retreat, the retreat. Uh, Christ. <laughs> the retreat was an instrument. That's an instrument, really cool instrument, but it's Jesus who's reaching out to us. That's a distinction that's very important. So when you talk about your experiences, it should only be in the context that it was all about Jesus. And then what has changed in my life since encountering Christ? Because whenever you go deeper, whenever you encounter Jesus, remember, this is supposed to be happening to us every time we go to Mass, right? You should be able to kind of, how's my life changed today? How's my life changed today? To be able to share that with somebody. Well, man, something bigger happened in your life. It, your life should look different. And that's important for people to see. When people are mired in sin and fear and darkness, they want to be shown light, even if they don't realize it yet. And so you can share, right, that before and after picture and showing them this is where I was struggling. This is how Jesus Got me out of it, and boy, here's what my life looks like now. Or here's what I had to give up. Or here's the sin I had to wrestle with. By the way, on the story of sin, always be careful, because sometimes people like to give the testimony of, like, well, I was struggling with this sin, and they start telling stories about the sin, and they almost start making the sin sound really good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so it's just like, I just had one guy spent like 10 minutes. It was going long, long, long. And like seven minutes of it was on the sin, and he was like smiling through it. I mean, don't get me wrong, it sounded like a great time, but <laughs> we, so I had to say, you know, I had to get up. It was an awkward moment. I might have to do it to one of you today. And I get up and say, okay, now you might have spent a little too much time celebrating the sin. And he didn't he didn't realize it, right? He was like, oh, I did. Yeah, so I said, all right, so let's kind of just mention the sin. Move on, right? Move on. Okay. Any questions 
Before we get to the activity, any questions on any of that? Yes. Yeah. I, I'd be like anything else with social media. Sure. So, I just say if there's no opportunity for follow up, it's like arguing with somebody on social media. I stopped doing that. I just stopped doing it. Because even because normally it wasn't people who I'm actually in day to day relationship with. It was always somebody who I speak to once every 10 years or every five years. And I realized I'm not helping them. They're not helping me. So I just put pictures of my family. Okay? And fun things. And that doesn't, it doesn't mean I don't drop nuggets. Like, like you know, I a link here and there. And, and, but I just don't get into that anymore. And I think this would be kind of similar to that. Like, I'm going to just drop my personal testimony. And yes, it might benefit. Somebody might see it and go, it might be a God moment. But you can't do anything about that necessarily unless they reach out to you, right? So it's a little passive for me, just throwing it out there. Um, now, maybe you're doing it because you have an intentional way. You're thinking of somebody specifically. Does that make sense? Then follow up on it. You know, does that, does that help? So fine, go for it. But hopefully you have a game plan for particular people who might see it on social media. Yeah, that'd be mine. What about um, the idea of sort of having that aha moment, that, that one big event, there's a series of experiences yes. or events in your life? Yeah, so for those who are in virtual world, uh, the idea of that it's not one big aha moment, but a series of events over life. And by the way, that, that's probably that for most people. For most people. Even people who it took a while for them to drop their net. When they look back, they see kind of these, these little moments over time. Um, that gives opportunity for lots of little testimonies, right? Lots of little testimonies. Um, I think the aha moments... We tend to want it. That's why a lot of people, by the way, don't think their testimony is worthy, because worthy, they don't have this big, woohoo, you know? Um, but most human beings are living in the day-to-day -day subtleties. And that's why those, uh, kind of those nice little subtle journeys, stories to share is important, at least for me. Um, I can look back on my, my own journey and see these some profound moments on my retreats. I just shared that little one with you when I was in college. Um, but when I really think about it, where God has worked in my life, it's always been these smaller, quieter moments of life, some of which make sense to share, some not. But that's a good testimony to give to somebody, right? Hey, listen, you know, I, I've been kind of fighting this life thing for a long time. And, as, and I did give my life to Christ, and this is kind of where it happened. But, you know, truth be told, you and I, maybe it seems like we've been on a similar path where it's not that we close off, close our lives from God, but we've just kind of been trying to fight our way through this thing called life, and almost fighting against his hand in our life, almost kind of constantly turning away, maybe out of fear, maybe out of hurt, whatever it is. But God's trying to reach in your life right now. And just be aware, you know. Um, aha moments, those stories are pretty cool when you're at a big presentation. You know, Steuben, like again, Life in the Spirit, Steubenville. There, there are moments where these things, and it captures everybody's imagination, but then we don't want to lose sight of the people who are sitting in the room who are, I didn't have that experience. Am I not? Did I not give my life to Jesus? Did I, I don't have this big moment. Does he not love me as much? No, not at all. Not at all. That help that thank you for asking that. That's a one that people of mine. Any other questions? I'm sorry, yes. Comment? I found that for me, even though it depends on who I'm talking to, because I feel like I've had that two hundred different times. So like if I talk to the middle schooler, I might share like a particularly aha moment that might like resonate with them. Whereas if I'm talking to a high schooler, it's gonna be a different one. You know, I felt like for me it would be I've had multiple of those little encounters. Again, some of them are bigger than others, but again, like the audience who are talking to it, it's just like required sharing. Yeah, thanks. So the idea, folks, on in uh, in uh, on Zoom, 
the idea of that sometimes we can build up almost that little cachet of testimonies that we can then use for particular moments and particular audiences. Yeah, I think that's a great way of approaching it. Um, I have a great story about a drowning in my life. I'm just going to leave it at that. Right. <laughs> drowning, drowning, drowning. Nah, 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 I don't trust you enough yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. So if you go to your workbooks, And hopefully you've noticed, by the way, all throughout the workbook, we give you little suggestions for read more, right? Again, this is not, this is just the beginning, the beginning of the conversation. Chris, I took far more time with that than I was planning on. So you see, we have a bunch of questions here for you to begin to kind of map out a personal testimony. And again, you don't have to write out every word, but you may want to, it'll help you kind of prompt a couple of things to help you piece together a two to three minute testimony. All right, so we're going to give you five minutes or so, seven minutes, not much more than that. Let me breathe. So again, to kind of craft out a personal testimony, maybe you already have one that's sitting there ready to go, and then we we'll would ask for three or four volunteers, all right? For those of you out there in the virtual world, um, when we go into, like we did before, when we go into the sharing, calling for volunteers, if you're with a group, um, wherever you are, I would ask that you just ask for a volunteer or two to share their personal testimony. Somebody on, at your site, to keep in mind, keep somebody behind them. Very important. Three minutes max. Three minutes max. Don't let anybody go up to 20 minutes because we have to move to another session. All right, so I'll give you two minutes and I'll be back to ask for some volunteers. All right, so remember, Personal testimony. Nobody's going to argue with you about your story. I'm here to make sure that you're remembering the ABCs, the one, two, threes, okay? And three minutes. Well, that's going to keep you in track. Three minutes. All right. So who's our. No, you, you, want to, you don't have to do it that way. It's just the question should have formulated kind of like a testimony. So you kind of want to piece it together. Like, so picture yourself. In a situation where, well, you are in a situation where you'll be sharing your testimony with a lot of other people in this case. Um, yeah, so you want to turn into a story. So I'm going to have you, you might go up again. Yeah. Hi, my name is Noelle. I'm from St. Anthony. Um, on the way, escaping from Vietnam to the post freedom land, uh, we encounter, you know, I was one of the boat people that kind of on the boat that contained 38 people, very, very small. Um, it's a wooden boat. It's a it's a merchant boat. It's not like anything like it. Not like a cruise line or anything. And on the way there, it usually takes four days to go to Hong Kong, but it took us a month because we didn't know what we were doing. The adult. I was thirteen years old. That was forty three years ago. And uh, the it was a stormy night. And we were holding each other. We were going to die because a little wooden boat in the large um, Pacific Ocean, right? The water already come up to the to the to the right over us. And um, and at that moment, I was very cold, and I and I was saying to myself, I say, it's going to be colder. In the bottom of the ocean. How is my mom going to know that I died? It was very cold. And at that moment, I remember a passage that I read from a Baptist woman 
that gave me when I was seven. In front of my house, I was sitting there one afternoon, um, and then she passed by and said, hey kid, do you want to be happy? And I said, of course I want to be happy. I'm going to give you a gift. If you read it, your life is going to be happy. And seven years old kid, sure. So at that afternoon, I read that little pamphlet that she gave me. And I remember in the front cover, it had a bridge. And it said something like, um, on the other side is a, is a sea of life or something like that. So I read, and I remember one of the gospel story that on the stormy night, St. Peter, waking Jesus up. I remember that. And this is like from seven to 13, that means six years later, we're not reading that again. And I said, I spoke out loud, and that was my first time praying out loud. I said, oh, Jesus, remember? Remember you did it before? Can you do it again? And the sea was calm, and nobody knew what's going on. I didn't know what's going on either. Oh, me. And of course there were series, <laughs> but but I began, I began to emphasize on reading the gospel. Imagine if I didn't read that one story. I would know who to call to. So my mission is to pass out free Bible to all the children. That's my life mission. Thank you. Thank you. We followed all the. I see it. Did you see the pattern? I don't know how you held it together like that, but that was beautiful. But you kind of got the story in. You got the the that Jesus was obviously covered there, <laughs> and and then the mission piece, right? It led to a change in your life and a mission. Um, and quite frankly, I don't know about anybody else here, but it almost demanded a response from me in some way, whether internally or externally. No, that was beautiful. All right. Three things. Oh, three things. Yeah. I tend to overextend myself. I'll be quick. Um, I'm a bachelor's in engineering, master's in information system. I'm skeptical by training. I was introduced casually to the pro life movement by Grace. That was the first time I sort of like began to take serious uh, evangelization. Next, Grace introduced me to adoration. Never ever in my whole life experienced adoration. Backtrack a little bit, I was introduced to the charismatic movement. I freaked out. I began to speak in languages. I began to speak French. Never learned the French language. Grace is witness, we have other witnesses. Next, <clears throat> go to adoration. I started spending there one hour. I started, I was introduced to Thomas Aquinas, the Summa Theological. Before that, I was looking for the meaning of life, happiness. I found those answers in Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theological. I didn't know what it was. I used to spend hours in our nation. He got to the program where I began to hear voices. I never, ever got a diary in my existence. I began to write a diary for the first time. I was hearing so, much, so many voices, so many different things, I began to write down the dates by what I heard. Then when I go back and review what I wrote, there were prophecies. And I began to freak out. Oh my God, what's going on? It's not possible that I could be hearing God's voice. So I began to to, to to read these things at the time didn't make sense. Then I would read them maybe months later, they began to make sense. Fast forward, <clears throat> what really freaked me out is 
I even heard the Blessed Mother speaking to me, but did not realize it was her. <clears throat> the reason why it was her, because I was looking at the statue and I heard a voice that says, uh, can you help? And then the voice said, the Blue Mother, it was right here like St. Agnes. So I stayed up and I called my mother, Mom, are you okay? Because I thought it was something, you know, my mom or something, I don't know, six cents. But I'm fine, so I went back to the adoration chapel. And I asked, I, I didn't tell you else, but I said, where have you been in my life? Then I heard a voice that says you were you almost died. I remember my mother told me years ago, <clears throat> I had a tomb brother. Years ago, my mother told me that I almost didn't make it. I almost died. So now I realize I'm here from her as well. Fast forward, now I'm freaked out. I'm trying to tell the whole world, the whole world thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> they don't believe me. So I began a conversation. I used to talk, I used to hear. From that point on, I began to ask questions. Got to the point where I hear voices. Do you have any more questions? Wake up. Things like that. I can, I can go on and on and on. Um, fast forward, there's a book that I came across called, forgive my uh, pronunciation, In Silu Yesu. It's in Latin. It's the diary of a priest that heard the voice of Christ in adoration. When I opened that book, I was at a, I freaked out because the things I read, I experienced a lot of it right here in adoration. So now I'm thinking I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story is this the biggest treasure of us Catholic, or one of the biggest treasures, is adoration. And in the book, in single years I read, because this is something Jesus was telling the priest, talk to my mother as much as you talk to me. She's present in adoration. So I would love to spend hours talking because there's a lot of experiences, but I just wanted to summarize that we have a treasure in adoration. By all means, spend a lot of time. If, if you know, my, my advice is spend hours Couple of weeks, I guarantee you, you will hear. I guarantee you. God bless. That was excellent. Only one problem. It was one three minutes. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. What's that? You didn't, yeah, you didn't need a mic either, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know how to project. <laughs> So again, we kind of those are two amazing stories, right? It's people happening. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you for sharing both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, now I don't want us to fall into the trap because I know that all of you have stories, and I really challenge you to pray about your story or your stories, no matter how small or simple it seems to you. Just. If God's put those stories on your heart, hold on to that. Practice it with a friend or a family member so that you're ready to share your story with the person that God puts into your life. I cannot emphasize this enough. Every story, every experience of God's grace that we all experience, somebody will benefit from at the right time. For God, when God ordains that, right? It'll happen. But we have to be ready. If we're not ready to do it, we're not going to be able to share it to that person who God puts on our path. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a, just you're going to stand up and stretch a little bit. We're going to take a little bit of a larger, longer break between Chris's next session and my final session. But for now, if you want to stretch, and then it gives me time to hand this off to Chris.